as we begin all things with our sign of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we take a moment now to consciously place ourselves in the presence of our loving God who never leaves us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day, the beauty of your world, both the sun and the rain that makes this land so abundant and the celestial show that reminded us of your power and majesty. Father God, you have given us everything, including yourself at such depth beyond our imagining. We thank you for that gift and we pray that you will lighten our loads and allow us to let go of all that we hold that stop us from embracing the gift that you are in our life. And we pray tonight that we may open our minds and our hearts and our spirits to see where you will lead us. We ask your special blessing to send your spirit down upon Kristen that she may speak the words that you have for all of us. We know that when two or more are gathered in your name, you are in our midst. Well, Heavenly Father, we got three or four hundred, so we know you're all over the place. So we thank you for this night. We thank you in advance for the giftedness that you will share with us. And we pray this in joy and in hope and in confidence through Christ our Lord. Amen. That was not bad, but one more time. Through Christ our Lord. Um, how many of you were here last night by show of hands? Awesome. Outstanding. Okay, so we're going to do, well, I, some of you weren't, and that's okay. You're not going to get left behind. We're going to do just a little bit of review about what we talked about last night, because it leads into what we're going to talk about tonight. So last night, um, we started talking about who we are and seeing ourselves as God's beloved. God's beloved son or God's beloved daughter. That he loves us, that he brought us into life with him through virtue of our baptism. We share in the delight that he has for his son Jesus. He has that same delight in us. That's where we started. And so we, we talked about that barrier that we often have of not a lot of our barriers, but all of them that get in the way of us understanding and being able to see ourselves the way the Father sees us. So this morning I was um, on Facebook, as I am most mornings, and I ran across this. I thought this was perfect. Like Holy Spirit going, yep, this is it. This is what I wanted them to hear. This is a friend of mine posted this. It says, all I want to say to you is you are beloved. And all I hope is that you can hear these words spoken as spoken to you with all the tenderness and force that love can hold. My only desire is to make these words reverberate in every corner of your being. You are the beloved. That's from Henry Nowen. So that's where we start. We start with ourselves as God's beloved. But here's the thing. I am not naive. I didn't fall off the truck yesterday. I know that just because we talked about that last night, that we all maybe, maybe hopefully, my prayers took some steps in being able to see ourselves that way. But it doesn't mean that now we are all wonderfully basking in God's delight in us. And all of our barriers are knocked down, and we're coming here tonight going, yes, Jesus, whatever you want. Maybe some of you are, in which case, praise God. That's incredible. But I also know the reality is that just one night at a parish mission and one time of prayer together sometimes doesn't get that job done all the way. So I wanted to give you, um, point out to you a couple resources that are available to help you. If that's something, the stuff we talked about last night, being able to see yourself that way, is something you really struggle with, I have a couple thoughts for you. The first one is this, prayer. Prayer is the first way that we do this. It is in prayer we encounter the Father's love. We talked about last night the baptism of Jesus, and I don't know if you remember the line at the beginning of that reading, and after all the people had been baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. That is when he was able to and open to hearing the voice of the Father speak those words to him. And so it is in prayer that we can receive that blessing and that spirit. And so really, prayer is the foundation of seeing ourselves as God's beloved. That being said, 
That being said, there are two books that I recommend highly to help you or help people be able to work through that in prayer. These are not books I was able to bring with me at the table. I only have 50 pounds. I can fit in a suitcase <laughs> that they'll let me bring, so I couldn't bring everything. However, if you look at if you, um, our website, uh, burningheartsdisciples.org slash Ovido, if you go to that, I have all of the resources listed there for you with the link somewhere you can buy them so you don't have to feel like you have to furiously scribble all the information down. One of those books is called Be Healed. It is a book by Dr. Bob Schutz, outstanding Catholic book on healing and transforming ourselves into the image of God's beloved. The second book I recommend is called Loved As I Am. It's by Sister Miriam Heidland, and it is her journey of conversion into seeing herself as God's beloved as she is. Not once she became a sister, once she prayed more, once she did, 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 but just loved as she is. So I highly recommend those two resources. I also have, I do have for sale out there, have to, my mom, my mom texted me today, she goes, don't forget to plug your stuff. I said, okay, <laughs> that's my mom. So I have, um, I do have CDs out in the back. If you go to this website, you can download an MP3 version of it. This is, I would like to tell you, this is the talk I gave last night, but I never give the same talk exactly the same. So this is another mission I did where I sort of did the same, I had the same topic. God's love and God being a gift, and a pure gift, and that's what that is. So if you're interested in that, I have that for sale in the back, or you can download the MP3 on the website. Okay, commercial time is done. So, tonight we're going to keep diving into this understanding of who are we? Who are we? How do we come to understand who we are as created? How do we come to understand who we are as Christians? How do we come to understand who we are as Catholics? What is our identity? I'm going to be honest and tell you that if, if, if you're really, if you still can't see yourself as God's beloved and aren't even a little bit open to that, then th this is going to be a challenge to move on because that's the foundation. The foundation is understanding and knowing that you were loved, that you are loved. Remember what we said about Genesis, about how God created things in the beginning? All right. I want to read to you, so I talked to you also right about my grammar, Nazi tendencies. So when I was in grad school, I had to read through Genesis and write a paper on it. And it was a really good experience for me because I don't know about you, but anytime I read through the creation stories in Genesis, I'm usually like, yeah, 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 day one, day two, day three, and so on and so on, and it was good and it was good. Can we get to a good story now? Like I do, right? I just kind of, we gloss over it. We don't really pay attention. So I had to write this paper on the, the stories of creation in Genesis. And I found something that I thought was genius. I thought I was a genius for noticing it. That's your first sign usually that you're off base and maybe haven't been paying attention enough <laughs> and are not as smart as you think you are is when you start to go, look at how smart I am. So I wanna, um, I wanna read to you, this is from the first story of creation and it is when, the, um, is when God creates man and woman it's verse 26, if you're interested, chapter 1. It says, And then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In, in, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I noticed something in this verse about the way God talks about himself. I noticed he uses first person plural or first person personal pronouns, plural ones. I was like, look at this plural pronouns. God is using plural to talk about himself. Let us create man in our image. And I went, oh my gosh, look at that, the Trinity right there in Genesis. I bet nobody's noticed this. Well, of course they have. <laughs> Of course they have. Of course, of course. There's whole, like, you know, books written about that, that one thing. But what it made me realize is when I started to understand God as being love, truly God is love, he is a gift of self, 
And we understand that, as, as I mentioned last night, right, that God the Father pours himself out to God the Son. God the Son receives that love, pours it back to the Father, and the love between them is another person in the Holy Spirit. They are a perfect communion of persons. And the love between them is so perfect, and that gift, 100% gift, and 100% reception of one another makes them one being. People like, right, and I used to get frustrated at this when I was in high school. I, can we understand the Trinity? No, it's a mystery. I'm like, well, I mean, there is mystery in it, but it's not mystery in that it's incomprehensible completely to us. Because we can understand that this is how it works. This love that is between these persons is so perfect and pure and total that it makes them one being. This is the image and likeness we were created in. We were created in the image and likeness of a relationship. We were created in the image and likeness of a communion of persons. That's, what, that's the image and likeness we were created in. And in case we miss it, in case we miss that that's what we were created in, at the end of the story of creation, there's like an editor's note, right? And it says, and this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and the two become one flesh. I imagine like voiceover man, right? Saying it in the movies like, and this is why. <laughs> like as you're watching Adam and Eve together. And this is why. A man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become what? One. Because a husband pours his love out to his wife, and if the wife receives that love perfectly and pours herself back out to her husband, what happens? There is another person in a child. The family is the original icon of the Trinity. Husband, wife, child. Father, Son, Spirit. This is who we are. This is whose image we've been created in. To perfectly reflect and imitate and participate in that relationship of love. So when I was doing high school youth ministry, which I did for a number of years, I would get high, schools, high schoolers who would ask me, Kristen, why do I have to go to church? Why can't I just go pray on a mountaintop by myself? And I would say to them, well, first of all, we live in Wisconsin. There are no mountains. <laughs> so there's like a geographical barrier to being able to make that happen. But secondly, and more importantly, because it's not what we were created for. In fact, in the second story of creation, when God creates Adam and then creates the animals and parades the animals past Adam, asking him to name them, this, by the way, not a direct quote from Scripture. I'm paraphrasing liberally, right? He sees two ducks and two alligators and two elephants and two platypi, I think is how you say that, I don't know, right? He sees them parading past and he recognizes, wow, look, they each have a partner. And he goes, I'm not the partner to the animals and I'm clearly not a partner to God, so I'm all here by myself. And God says to him, it is not good for man to be alone. Remember what he said those first days of creation? It is good, 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 it is very good. And now we have God saying it is not good for man to be alone. Why? Because if man is alone, he has no one to whom he can totally and completely pour out himself. He has no one he can love. And that's whose image and likeness he was created in. And so he creates Eve. This is the, there's two stories of creation. If you didn't know that, I'm really sorry. I hope that doesn't rock your world. This is the second story of creation. And he creates Eve now, after noticing and making the comment, it is not good for man to be alone. And Eve is created out of his rib. Why? Because he's a part, she's a partner. She's equal to him, not above him, not below him, but his equal because it wasn't good for him to be alone. He needed a partner. And he wakes Adam up from the deep sleep he put him in, and Adam looks upon his bride and says, what I want my husband to say to me every morning when I wake up, 
And he rolls over and he looks at me. At last, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. At last, here you are for me. So I was teaching a class one time and I used that story and I forgot my husband was in the room. And he said, he said, to, the, he said to the crowd, because they all looked at him right away, and then I was like, oh shoot, I forgot he was here. And then he says, uh, I bet Eve didn't have dragon breath in the morning. I was like, <laughs> fair point. <laughs> That's totally fair. Why does he say that? Because he was created for relationship, and Eve was created for relationship, for to be able to give yourself. Because if, if love means to give yourself, to be a gift of self, then you need someone you can give to. And you need someone you can receive from if that is going to be a communion of persons. This is what we were created as. This is who we were created to be. We were created to be in relationship, in relationship with other people and in relationship with God. And at the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, that relationship was so perfect, and the love between God, Father, Son, Spirit, the love between God and his created, the love between Adam and Eve was perfect. It was total. The gift of themselves that they gave was constant, and it was complete, and they didn't hold anything back of themselves ever. And then... Like, that's two, two chapters of the Bible, right? Like, that's it. And then we get Genesis 3, and the fall happens. And everything that comes next is a result of Adam and Eve and people, humanity, us, forgetting that we were created for relationship. That we were created for other. Here's the thing about Genesis 3 and the fall. My uh, kids, I, so I'm going to, just for a second here, I'm going to label myself as a giant nerd. If a grammar Nazi didn't do it already, here it comes, all right? Here comes the nerd. How many of you are familiar with the TV show, BBC, Doctor Who? Where are my Whovians? Yeah, you are. Those are my people. Okay, you don't need to know anything about the TV show Doctor Who except that Doctor Who is an alien who travels in time and space. He has a spaceship that can go anywhere in time and space. My kids and I are sitting at the table, my husband too, for dinner one night, and we're talking about if you had a TARDIS, if you prefer a DeLorean, it works as well. If you had a TARDIS and could go anywhere in time and space, where would you go? What would you do? And my son, my youngest, Isaac, who was probably about four at the time, he was like, I would go back to yesterday when mom wouldn't give me ice cream because I was not nice, and I would be nice so I could get the ice cream. He's four. Like, yeah, good job. <laughs> and my daughter had just learned about September 11th. And so she says, I would go back to before September 11th to see if there would be something I could do to stop that from happening. And we're like, whoa, this got real, right? <laughs> we went from ice cream to 9-11. And my husband, he was next, social studies teacher, before he became a principal, says, uh, going off his daughter's lead, said, I would go back to before World War II and see if there's something I could do to stop the atrocities that happened in World War II. And we're like, I'm like, man, this is supposed to be a fun like dinner time conversation, we are getting real in the birdhouse right now. <laughs> so I turned to my, my son, Vinny. Now, Vinny is the oldest. I talked about him a little bit last night, the actually technically kid. He also is very much a philosopher. He has been since he was little. He likes to ask deep questions and think about deep things. He doesn't want to do math facts and refuses to learn his division, but he likes to do big thinking, deep things, always has. So I'm looking at him, I said, all right, bud, I said, what, what about you? If you could go anywhere with a TARDIS, where would you go? And he goes, you know, I would probably go back to the garden. Because if I could stop Adam and Eve from eating that apple, then none of these other things would have happened. And I'm like, I'm so glad he went before me. <laughs> like, <laughs> In his mind, he made the connection, right? That all of the brokenness from the little guy's ice cream cone he couldn't get because he wasn't nice, 
all the way up to World War II, all of it is a result of the fall. All of it is a result of original sin entering the world. And what is original sin? What does that mean? What does that look like? In my mind, original sin started because Adam and Eve didn't trust God. That's what original sin is. They didn't trust that he was a good father who wanted good things for them and who loved them. Because what happens, the snake shows up, right? And the snake, he's tricky at the beginning, sort of. I mean, I feel like, of course, I have the hindsight, like, that's good. I can look back and go, yeah, clearly, I would not listen to this. It's a snake, first of all. Hello. Like... But he's kind of tricky at the beginning. He's like, so did God tell you you couldn't eat of any of the trees in the garden? He knows what God told him. He knows that God told him you can eat of any tree except for that one. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All the rest of them you can eat from except that one, including the tree of life, which was the one that made things not bad that made them not get diseases and not age and were never going to die. They were eating of the tree of life, which was in the center of the garden. Does he tell you you can't eat any of them? And Eve stands up for God. No, of course not. God wouldn't say that. Again, paraphrasing, okay? So I take liberties occasionally. <laughs> I apologize. Um, she says, of course not. God wouldn't say that. He just said we can't eat of that one. He said, if we eat of it, we'll die. And the snake now tells his lie, outright blatant lie. You will not die. No, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you will become like gods yourself. And so the lie that the serpent tells is, you cannot trust that God made you the way he said he did. You cannot trust that you have been made in the image and likeness of God. So you need to go eat that because that's really going to make you like God. And Eve eats it and Adam eats it and now here we are. And immediately after they eat it, right, it says God comes walking in the garden in the breezy time of the day as he was known to do. Like, right, it's like he's kind of strolling around in the garden. And they're hiding, And this is what cracks me up, right? It reminds me of my kids when they're little and they do something wrong and they do something really wrong and you're like, and I would be like, Isaac William? And he's like, 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 so come on. He knows. He knows what they did already. We're hiding from you. Why are you hiding? Well, because we did what you told us not to. And here's the thing. You know, I don't know what would have happened. I really don't. But I imagine what could have happened, how things could have been different, if instead of hiding from God, if Adam and Eve, when God had come walking, had ran and jumped into his arms and said, we messed up, I don't know what we did, it was awful, I'm so sorry, Lord, we didn't trust you, you're so good. But that's not what they do. They hide away from him. They don't want to be by him. They don't want him to see them. They don't want him to see their shame. They don't want him to see their nakedness. They don't want him to see them at all right now in this place of sin. And this to me is one of the greatest ironies in all of scripture, right? They ate the fruit of the tree because they wanted to be like God, and yet they were already like God, as much like God as he could possibly have made them because that's how he made them. And so they didn't trust that he was good and that they could could believe him when he said that, and they, they make this choice. And because they make this choice now, we, they, no longer have access to life. Along with a list of other things that are going to go wrong for them. Now they don't have a garden that's just cropping up things for them to eat. They're not going to have all the animals around them all the time. Right? He says you're going to sweat and toil in order to get food from the ground. And the very thing that was supposed to be a sign of the fruitfulness and a sign of how much they were like God. In that, when the husband poured his love out to his wife and she received it, there was another person. This is now going to cause pain. 
Why? Because this was the way that God created them to show that they were like him, to reflect that relationship. And they don't really reflect it anymore. They've broken that relationship. And so now, to reflect that is going to hurt. It's going to hurt them to reflect that relationship, to participate in that kind of love, because it will be a reminder always that they're not doing it right, that they could have had it, and they, they broke it off. They cut themselves off. They did not trust. And so this is where we end up today. This is where we end up with issues out the wazoo. This is why we have barriers, and this is why all of it. This is why we have hurricanes. This is why, this is why all the things happen that are not good. All the things happen that are not good because the world now is a fallen place. Because we now have disease. We now have aging. We now have hatred and anger and we have war and we have, right? And people constantly act in ways to cut themselves off from God and one another. And those effects reverberate throughout the lives of everyone else and throughout history in a lot of cases. This is the problem. This is where we are. And so last night I talked about death and I said God doesn't, God doesn't take he doesn't steal, right? Death takes. Death takes, not God. And death wasn't a part of the plan. Death wasn't the way he created it. He created them to have eternal life. And this is what is so amazing to me about Genesis 3. We're three chapters in. He's done it all. They messed it up. You realize, right, that God could have been like, done with that one, earth, 2.0, here we go. Let's try again. New, new way. Let's make this happen. We're going to start over. He's God. He absolutely could have. But he didn't. He didn't. He said there were only two of them. There were only two people at this point. And he said, I love them too much. Despite the fact that they don't want it, I am going to continue to give myself to them. And he makes a promise after he curses Adam and Eve and the ground and the snake and like everything gets cursed at the end of Genesis chapter 3. At the end, he makes a promise that it's not always going to be this way. It's not always going to be this way. That death and sin do not have the final say. Imagine how depressing it would be if we ended with Genesis 3. Like, <laughs> but for a long time in our history of people, of humanity, that's what there was. And this kind of vague promise of something greater coming down the road. Eventually, it's not going to be this way anymore. And so then we fast forward. We fast forward through, well, like three quarters of the Bible. Because let's be honest, the Old Testament's not half. The Old Testament's a lot longer than the New Testament. And we now have people who are created for relationship, just like we were in the beginning, and we're not in relationships. We're not in relationships that reflect the love of the Trinity. We're not in relationships that participate in that communion of love. We are all over the place in the Old Testament. Read, 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 and every time you're going to find ways that we are still not trusting God's promise. Not trusting his promise that he created us good. Not trusting his promise that he created us to be a part of this self-giving love, to participate in it. And not trusting his promise that it's not always going to be this way. That's it. That's our big, I mean, in, in my mind, right, that's our big sin. We don't trust. From the beginning to Adam and Eve all the way through history, we don't trust when God tells us he's going to do something that he will deliver on his promises. We don't trust that he loves us. We don't trust that he gives himself to us. And so we end up in first century Jerusalem. And we have now a reminder after we have forgotten, 
let's be honest, that's what happened, right? We forgot. We forgot what we were, whose image we were created in. We forgot what we were created for. And we now have in the incarnation someone who reminds us who we are. Someone who reminds us who we were created to be. And someone who now comes on the scene in order to make good on God's promise that death does not get the final say. That sin is not the end of the story. This is not over. This is not done. This is a picture of the Annunciation. It's one of my favorite pictures. I have a very strong devotion to the Annunciation. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what was said in my videos, so if you saw it, I apologize if this is a repeat, but um, my, one of my really big moments of first encountering Jesus, of first really understanding what that meant, to not just having an, exp an emotional experience, because I had that, I talked about that last night on a racetrack in France, right? But to really understand Jesus and what it was that he wanted to do for me, the first time that happened for me was connected to Our Lady of the Annunciation. I was on a, a mission trip, I was or leading ki kids on a, not a mission trip, a Steubenville, and I had forgotten that um, I was supposed to talk to the girls, as I am known to do. I forget. It happens, right? And so we, we're all ready to go on this trip, and the head youth minister says, now Kristen's going to take the ladies down to the chapel. She's going to talk to you about what it means to be a woman of God. And I went, okay, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> and I walked past my office. And I grabbed, by virtue of the Holy Spirit and it being the closest thing that I could grab, the Bible. And I am slowly walking to the chapel. And I'm going, woman of God, woman of God, woman of God, woman of God. Mary was a woman of God. You know what? I went to Catholic school. And that means I know that the story of Mary is in the first chapter of Luke. So I open to the first chapter of Luke. And as I walk into the chapel, I say, we're going to talk about what it means to be a woman of God. And I just read the story of the Annunciation. The whole time going, Lord Jesus, give me some words to say to these girls because I have nothing. And the only thing I remember saying was that to be a woman of God meant to be someone who said yes to Jesus, said yes to God, even when you didn't know what it meant. It meant to have radical trust. To trust that he only wants good things for you, even if you can't see it. I'm sure that I said many, many other wonderful things that those girls wrote down and remember to this day. Certain of it. That's the only thing I remember saying. So fast forward to the Steubenville trip. We had a girl on the trip who'd never been to confession before. Never. Somehow she got confirmed. Hadn't been to confession. I was like, we should fix that. She says, I think I want to go to confession. And I'm like, look at me, I'm a great youth minister because this girl wants to go to confession. She said, but I've never done it, I don't know what to do. I said, that's just fine, I will take you, we'll go together. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to one of these conferences, a big conference where they have confession. It's not like coming to church and going and meeting Father, right? You like walk in and there's a giant gymnasium with like 30 priests set up with chairs. He's in a chair and there's a chair next to him. And they have what I refer to as the confession hostess, who stands at the entryway of the door, and everyone's lined up, and when you get to her, she looks to see which priest is open, and she sends you, right? You go to that one, and you go to that one. So she and I, this girl and I, are waiting in line, and we're talking, and I'm walking her through, like, examination of conscience she had done, so I'm talking her through what this looks like, how do you go to confession, I keep telling her over and over, it's okay. You can really just get there, sit down, and say, Father, I don't know what to do. He will walk you through it. It's going to be great. No problem. This is going to be wonderful. Right? Giving her this pep talk. We get to the confession hostess, and she says, all right, you go over there. And I stand there, all proud youth minister, and I'm watching. I'm like, look at her go. Like, this is so great. And the confession hostess turns to me and says, and you can go over there. And I went like, oh, <laughs> I am not prepared for this. So I start my slow walk, and I'm like, examination of conscience, confession, confession, I, don't, I got nothing. And I sit down in front of the priest, who I think was 80, 90 years old. You know these priests you've ever seen? They're like the hunched over old, always bald, probably a friar, because I feel like they're always wearing the, right? And I sit down in front of him, and I go, Brother, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And he's like, okay, and we start, and he says, tell me what's going on. And I looked, and I go, Father, I got nothing. <laughs> and he's like, what do you what do you mean? 
And I said, I told him what happened. I was waiting in line with one of my teenagers, and I said, I am not prepared. And I'm not kidding. When I came out to sit down and talk to you, my mind went blank. I have no idea what to say. And he says to me, why don't you tell me the biggest thing on your heart right now, the biggest thing you are struggling with. Now, my husband had proposed to me before I left this for this trip, and I had said yes. And on this trip, I was starting to do the whole, like, oh, wait, did I really think about this? Is this really right? I don't even know. What, what am I doing? Like, ah, is this the right? I have no idea. What's happening? I don't know. And so I pour all this out to this little 80-year-old priest, 85, 90-year-old priest. And he says to me, my or he says, my dear, I would like you to reflect on Our Lady of the Annunciation. And I don't remember another thing he said. Because I felt like Mary, in a very loving and gentle and kind way, hit me with a two-by-four and said, hey, dummy, I love you. You just said all this to these girls. Right? Like, again, I think I might have mentioned to some of you, a lot of times when I'm giving these talks, I'm not talking for you, I'm talking for me. I'm like, literally, like the Holy Spirit is talking out my mouth and right back at me. And that's exactly what happened to those girls. I gave them this message, and it was like, hey, you, pay attention to what you're saying. It means to say yes to God even when you don't know what it means. It means to trust that he wants good things for your life. It means to trust him. Trust that he loves you. And so I went to adoration that night. I went to adoration that night, and I said, okay, Jesus. I'm in. I'm in. I'm not just in. I mean, I'm in to get married, which, by the way, my husband did not hear this story until many years later, and he was really grateful <laughs> for that moment. But it doesn't just mean I'm in for get, to get married, right? My I'm in at that point was that I'm in. What it, I get it. I understand what you're saying, and I really want to. It doesn't mean I'm going to do it right, but I really want to try to live this way. I really want to try to do this for you. Um, about a year after my husband and I got married, my grandfather passed away. My grandfather was one of 15 children. They lived on a farm in Indiana. And my great-grandmother, now at that time there were only three sets of mysteries of the rosary. No St. John Paul II to have given us the luminous, right? Three sets of mysteries of the rosary. And my grandmother assigned every kid a mystery of the rosary. And their job every day was to pray their mystery of the rosary for their family. Now they also, often also play, prayed full rosaries together, but every kid every day had to pray one mystery of the rosary. My grandpa was a POW in World War II. He got captured by the Germans, got shot, shot down in his plane, he was in the Air Force, over Germany and was captured and was in, in, in death camps, in POW camps, in um, Germany in World War II, bef right before the end of the war, and then was released. My great-grandmother, when he was gone missing, he was marked as one of the missing, would not let any of the other kids take his mystery of the rosary, because she said, he needs to be praying that for our family, and if we let someone else take that mystery, it means we've given up on him. And she said, I will not do that. My grandfather has said, had said at that at later in life, that some days having to pray that mystery was the only thing that kept him from giving up hope. That there were absolutely days where that mystery kept him alive because he knew his entire family was counting on him. That they'd have all the other ones done, but not that one. When my grandpa died a year after my wedding, I found out that my grandpa's mystery of the rosary was the Annunciation. And it was like a little reminder for me, right? And so I got, um, we took the roses that were from my grandpa's um, funeral, and there's a, there's a place that makes those roses into rosaries for the, um, that you put on the casket. They can take the flowers and make them into rosaries. So I have one, I have one of those rosaries, and it's, a, it's very precious to me. And I particularly pray the mystery of the Annunciation on that rosary um, in honor of my grandfather, but also in honor of my moment of being able to say, I get it and I will trust, even if I don't know what that means. And I will tell you, I had no idea what that meant. No idea what that meant. No idea what I was getting myself into. And there were times later in life where I probably, there were days I wish I could have taken it back. But I didn't. I didn't do it. So that's one of the reasons I love 
images of the Annunciation. Because in the Incarnation, when Jesus becomes man, becomes human, he takes on our body to remind us what we were created for. To remind us that we were created to imitate and participate in and reflect the life of the Trinity and the love that God has and is to be self-gift. That that's our purpose, that's our mission and he did it so well and so much and so powerfully that he literally gave himself. Because he is God, and that's who God is. Gift of self. Here's the other thing that happened, though. When God gives himself so powerfully, death didn't take Jesus. Death couldn't take Jesus. Jesus, death is a result of sin in the world, not like personal sin, right? But death is a result of sin in the world, of original sin, of living in a fallen world. He didn't have any of that. Death couldn't take him. Death couldn't touch him. It wasn't allowed. He wouldn't have had disease. He wouldn't have had illness. He wouldn't have aged in that way, like gotten, I mean, he grew up, right? But he wouldn't have aged until his body started shutting down and he just died a natural death. That wouldn't have happened for Jesus. So when he gave himself to even death for us, God fulfilled his promise from Genesis chapter 3. When Jesus gave himself to death, he said, you are no longer the end of the story. Because he gave himself into death, so that he could continue to give himself to us after our death. And we sang beautifully in that song we sang earlier tonight about death having, I don't remember the words exactly, but death have, essentially death lost its sting, right? And we say that in scripture, that death has no power anymore. It doesn't mean death can't take us. It doesn't mean that we won't die someday. It means that death is no longer the end of the story. It means that when we die, we have the opportunity to accept the gift that Jesus wants to give us, the gift that the Father wants to give us, to accept eternal life. That's what Jesus did. That's who we are now. That's who we've been created to be. We sometimes think that Christianity is about doctrine, and it's about rules, and it's about, I don't know, pr certain practices or devotions or any of this stuff. Look, I, I love the sacraments. God created one sacrament in the beginning, the sacrament of marriage. That was the only one we were supposed to need to be able to participate in the life of the Trinity. When we messed it up, he gave us six more. <laughs> like, okay, we gotta, we gotta fill this out here. We gotta give him some other ways to get it done. <laughs> because they messed up that one, so let's do this. Right, he gave us six more, so we had more opportunities to enter in and participate in that life. But the ultimate sacrament isn't a doctrine. And the ultimate sacrament isn't a ritual. The ultimate way that we participate in the divine life of the Trinity, that we become who we were created to be, is a person. Christianity is not a philosophy, it's not an ideology, it's not a set of rules, it's not some books, it's not, it is a person. We have been created for relationship. Relationship with one another and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And by virtue of our baptism, guess what? We have that capacity in us to do it. That's what baptism does. We talked about that last night, right? We've, we've been given the capacity. Hey, you're on equal footing. You are now equal to Jesus in the Father's eyes. He sees you with the same love that he sees Jesus. He delights in you the same way he delights in Jesus. So the only thing keeping us from really seeing Jesus as a brother as someone with whom we can be in a relationship like that, is that we don't believe him. 
that we don't trust him. Yeah, but not me. I had a conversation with someone once, and I asked him, tell me about your relationship with Jesus, because I do that. I'm a church person, so (laughs) it happens to people around me quite a bit. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. And he said to me, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. That wouldn't be appropriate. That wouldn't be appropriate. I said, why not? Because he's God and I'm not. Do you know that St. Augustine said that by virtue of our baptism, we are human beings who have the capacity to become like God? That's not me. That's St. Augustine. Don't throw tomatoes. We have the capacity to become like God by virtue of our baptism. God became like us so that we could become like him. And not just like, I don't know, amazing beings who do whatever we think God does. But I mean so that we could be in relationship with him, that we could be on equal footing with him, that we could love him, give ourselves to him, and accept when he wants to give himself to us. It does not mean we are divine. At least I'm not yet. I'm not there. But that's the capacity that's been placed within me to become like God. Of course it is. That's who he created me to be from the very beginning. He created me to be like him in his image and likeness, in their image and likeness. So this is the good news of our faith. The good news of our faith isn't news. The good news of our faith isn't a story. The good news of our faith isn't a history. The good news of our faith is a person. It's a person. Do you see Jesus as a person? Cardinal Dolan, they did an interview with Cardinal Dolan when he was first cardinal, and one of the questions they asked him is, name three people living today that now that you're a cardinal and you have all this power, which they they don't, but now that you're a cardinal and you have all this power that you would want to have um, dinner with. And he named, I don't remember who the two other people are, and then he said Jesus. And the interviewer, well, and you know that the interviewer wasn't Catholic, right? Because he asked him, because you have power now as a cardinal. <laughs> so he said, uh, he goes, I, I said living people. And Cardinal Dolan said to him, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He conquered death so that it no longer has the final say. And so that now when we are facing death, we now can say, you know what? You don't get to take me. I am giving myself to the Father so I can go home. That's our response in the faith of death, face of death as Christians. You don't get to steal me. I'm giving myself because I know that you, don't, you aren't the end of the story. I make death a person here. I apologize if that confuses people. Death isn't a person. It just is. But right, Death doesn't get to take me. I want to give myself back to the Lord. When? I don't know. Hopefully not tonight. That's what death is. It's my opportunity to say, I finally get to be in the relationship I was created to be in. I finally get to be who I was made to be, to fulfill everything I have been longing for before I even knew to long for it. Everything our entire humanity has been longing for since Genesis chapter 3 to be back in that relationship, to participate in and reflect and imitate the life of the Trinity, to be gift of self forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's what we have in front of us. And so what does heaven look like? I don't know. I don't know if there are angels with harps and clouds. I don't know if there are streets paved with gold or milk and honey or any of that stuff because it doesn't matter. All I know is that I get to be who I was created to be. That's why we say it feels like coming home, right? That we say we go home to heaven. I talked to my mom today, right? She's out in Charleston with my family. And I asked her how Jason was doing, my cousin with Down syndrome, after his, after his dad's death. And they went to the funeral home today to see his body. And my, my cousin from Colorado, this is the first time he's had the chance to see his dad after he died. And Jason was with them, and I was like, oh, how did that go? 
And my mom said, Jason's fantastic. Jason's better than anybody else is. And I said, tell what, like why, how, what? And he said, he looked at his dad and he said, that's okay, mom, he's in heaven now. He finally gets to be with Jesus. That's the attitude that we can have towards death when we understand and we know and have a relationship with the Lord to know that it's not the end. That means that we can, with the faith of a child, say, that's okay, he gets to be with Jesus. Not that God took him, and that should give us comfort, right? Not that it was his time as if we all have like a string coming out of our heads that's just getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. But that they got to go home to Jesus. That's it. That's our goal. And everything we do as church here, as Catholic Christians, every single thing we do is meant to give us tastes of being who we were created to be. They are tastes of heaven. They are tastes of what it means to try to live this life, to live in perfect relationship with one another, in relationship with God, to be giving of ourselves and receiving of those gifts of love. That's what that looks like. That's what the church meant, is meant to do. That's it. That's what we're about. That's who we are. We are created for relationship. The relationship that we're created for, by the way, has a name. It's called discipleship. That's what we call, a disciple is what we call someone who has this relationship with Jesus. We call them a disciple. How do we know that? Because we have examples in scripture. At least 12, 11 of them. Look, even Jesus wasn't 100% on that discipleship relationship stuff, right? Even the ones who got to walk with him every day, sleep with him, eat with him, laugh with him, cry with him, I don't know, go to the bathroom with him, whatever they did. I'm, all of them, for three years that they got to do that with Jesus, even one of them walked away at the end. Even one of them didn't trust that God had good things for him. So this relationship is called discipleship. Now, there's a phenomenal um, booklet. You may have seen it out in the back. It's this one. It's called The Ultimate Relationship because we were created for relationship. So, oh, is it not going to go? Oh, it says I lost my connection. That's bad. Can somebody just click my button for me? To the next slide. Um, it's called The Ultimate Relationship. This talks, it's just what we're talking about, right? Super simple, really basic stuff on what it means to be a relationship and what discipleship looks like. This is one of my favorite parts of this book. It talks about how do you know what it means to be a disciple? How do you know what it means to have dropped your nets, to have given your yes to Jesus? How do you know? What does that look like? I don't know. And they compare it in this book to a marriage. And they say, Okay, I'm going to use my husband and I as an example, right? I met my husband in college. When we met, we were friends first for a little while, and then we started dating, then we got engaged, then we got married. When I met him, from that point, he was a part of my life. From a guy I just knew to someone I was in a relationship with, like dating and whatever, right? He was a part of my life. He, before I met him, he was outside of my life. I didn't even know he existed, right? And then I met him, and he was a part of my life. He was a part of my life in bigger and smaller ways throughout our relationship. But there came a moment in our relationship where my husband became the center of my life. And that moment wasn't when I said yes to being engaged. Obviously, because two days later, I was freaking out. <laughs> that moment that he became the center of my life was the day we stood in that church before God and one another and our family and friends and made vows to each other. Because the vows we made were vows that said, you are now the center of my life. And the vows we say at our wedding ceremonies are vows that imitate, that remind us that we imitate and reflect the love of the Trinity. Is your love going to be freely given? 
Is your love going to be complete and total and without reservation? Will it be fruitful the way the Trinity's love is fruitful? We made those promises. And at that moment, my husband became the center of my life. And I was the most perfect wife that you could have ever asked for. And I did everything right. And we never fought. And our life has been hunky-dory roses and cupcakes ever since. Of course not. I don't even like cupcakes very much. <laughs> of course not. Just because I made a commitment to my husband that he was going to be the center of my life didn't make me a perfect wife. And I will tell you it did not make him a perfect husband. <laughs> It didn't. We weren't perfect. We have our ups and downs and our growing and our not and just all these right back and forth and all of this. But we had made a commitment to one another to say, I desire to live my life as if you are the center of my life from now until the day I die. That's my desire. I made that commitment. So we can think about it very similarly in our relationship with Jesus when we think about discipleship. Remember again, marriage is the, the thing, right, that was created at the beginning to show us. Okay, so, oh, it came back. Maybe. Maybe not. Okay, click the next one for me. It's still trying to figure out what it wants to do. All right. And it's gone. Oh, no, 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 stop. Don't do that. There we go. Okay, I got it now. I'm good now. All right. Oh, I love technology. Okay. So the same thing is true of our relationship with Jesus, right? There's a point at which Jesus is outside of our lives. If you were baptized in an infant, that time is like eh, that long, when Jesus is outside of your life. If you weren't baptized until later in life, it might have been a long time that Jesus was not a part of your life. He was outside your life completely. And then once we've been baptized or once we start to hear about Jesus, he now becomes a part of our life, whether we know it or not, whether we recognize it or not, right? But he can be a bigger or smaller part of our lives. He can be a bigger or smaller part of our lives. But there has to come a moment where we look at Jesus and say, I desire you to be the absolute center of my life. I want to be very clear about something. You don't look at Jesus and say, I desire the Catholic Church to be at the center of my life. You look at Jesus and you say, I desire you to be at the center of my life. The Catholic Church is not our faith. The Catholic Church is not the source of our faith. The Catholic Church is not the first relationship that we are called to as disciples. The first relationship we are called to is a relationship with a person, not a church. First, to Jesus Christ. Then he takes us by the hand into his community, where we now have other relationships to help us live out in the same way that after my husband and I got married, he did what? He took me by the hand into, God love them, his family. <laughs> and I took him by the hand and took him into my incredibly amazing family. <laughs> and why? Because now we are a part of family that helped teach us how to do this thing, make this commitment happen that we've tried, said we're going to try to do. But first comes Jesus. And then he takes us into his church and says, this is my family, and they are going to help show you what it means to live out this commitment that you've given to me. I want you to look at those three pictures, and I want you to think to yourself about which one best represents your current relationship with Jesus, and I'm going to tell you what you don't like to hear. There is no two and a half. There's not. There's just not a two and a half. He's either, you have either made the commitment for him to be the center of your life, or you haven't yet. Saying that you're in number three does not mean you are a perfect Christian. It doesn't mean you live life amazingly and you've got it all figured out. Any more than me saying yes to my husband in that church that day 14 years ago means that I was the perfect wife. 
but it means you've made that commitment to him. Here's a question to help you if you're not sure. If you were to die today, I hope nobody does. If you were to die today, and Jesus himself were to meet you at the gates of heaven, none of the St. Peter stuff for our analogy, right? Okay, Jesus himself at the gates of heaven, and he were to look at you and say, why should I let you in? What would your answer be? Why should I let you in? I'm going to tell you right now that if the answer sounds like a spiritual resume, well, because I've done X, Y, and X many masses in my life, and I've said these rosaries in my life, and I have helped these people, and I worked for these years in the church, and I volunteered in this ministry, and I went to these Bible studies, and I read this many pages of Scripture, and I spent this many hours volunteering, if it sounds like a spiritual resume, that may be a sign that you're in box number two. Because the answer to the question, why should I let you in, the answer to the question, why should I let you in, is something like, because you give to me, because you love me, and I accept you. You have invited me, and I have accepted your invitation because of you, Jesus. Now, I have to say this clarification for Catholics because they get all like, <gasps> this is a Catholic book, by the way. They get all like, ah, what do you mean? It is possible that Jesus may ask you a follow-up question if you say, <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know. It's possible he may ask you a follow-up question if you say to him, because of you, Jesus, that's why. And the follow-up question may be, how do I know? How do I know? At which point comes all of the things that we do. Why do we do those things? Not because we feel guilty if we don't. Not because we feel someone out there that we are obligated. Not even out of habit. We do those things because we love Jesus. Why do we go to Mass on Sunday? We call them Holy Days of Obligation. I hate the word Holy Day of Obligation. I understand why the church does it. But I don't like that word. You know why? Because I don't go to Mass because I'm obligated to. I mean, some days maybe I do. But ultimately, that's not, that's not a sign, right, of a relationship with Jesus, going to Mass because I'm supposed to. Why do I go to Mass? Because I love Jesus. And that is the time I get to be absolutely, the, physically the closest to him. That's why I go to Mass. That's why I don't want to miss a Mass. Why do I go to confession? Well, because the church precepts say that you have to go to confession once a year, preferably in the... No! That's not why we go to confession. We go to confession because we love Jesus. And that means when we hurt our relationship with him, we say to him, I am so sorry because I love you that I hurt you. This is something in my marriage relationship that I suck at. <laughs> like, I am so bad at apologizing, the worst ever at apologizing. I'll do something to hurt my husband, and, well, he's an only child. We're not even going to get into only children, but, and I'm an oldest child, and that means that when we do things to hurt each other, we're like, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, here's why you're wrong, and we're going to think our way out of the problem by arguing so I can convince you that you were wrong and I was right. That's really the ultimate thing. <laughs> but when I know that I have hurt my husband, and when I step back from my argumentative and my desire to be right all the time in every way, when I can step back from that and see that I have hurt him, I feel bad. I feel bad for him because I love him. I really do desire the good for him. And when I'm not that good, when I am the opposite of the good I desire for him, I feel awful. And then I would go to my husband, hopefully I do this more, I need to do it more, and say I'm sorry. I am so sorry for the way that I hurt you. Can we please restore this relationship so we can get back on track? That's what confession is. 
Confession is saying, Jesus, I'm so sorry I hurt you, and I hurt our relationship, and I desperately want to get this back on track. In which time, confession isn't a thing to, it's like, you know, the church is like beating you with a stick and making you wear hair shirts and, I don't know, sackcloth and ashes and the whole thing. You don't feel bad because the church tells you to feel bad. If we are starting and beginning in a relationship with Jesus, we feel bad because we don't want to hurt someone we love. We switched our kids from Catholic school to public school a couple years ago for a variety of reasons that I won't get into. But uh, one of the things that happened was my son suddenly started realizing that not every, my oldest started realizing not everyone believes the same thing he does. And they were having a discussion in science class that like went off, right? Like it's one of those, and it happens especially with like late elementary, middle school kids where it's like all of a sudden you're like, whoa, how did, as a teacher I know this, right? How, how did we end up here? I have no idea. And they were talking about where the world came from. They were doing planetary stuff and they're talking, where did the earth come from? And the teacher did a great job of saying, we don't really know for sure where the world came from. There are lots of different theories. That's what she said. We don't know for sure because nobody was there. There are lots of different theories about where the world came from. And she was ready to move on. And the kids kept the conversation going among themselves later. And the conversation was, well, which theory do you believe? Well, which theory do you believe? And one of the boys that my son was a friend with looked at him and said, you're not one of those people who believes that God did all this, are you? And my son goes, well, yeah, I am. And this little boy looked at my son and said, I hate God. And my son got in the car that day after school and started crying. And I said, honey, what's wrong? And he said, I told, one of my friends told me today that he hates God. I said, why, why does that make you so sad? He said, because I love God. And I don't want anyone to hate him. And I said to him, you know what, honey, that is okay. Because if somebody told me they hated you, it would make me sad. If somebody told me they hated your daddy, it would make me sad. Because I love you and I love your daddy. And you love God and you don't want people to say that about him. That's the relationship we're called to with Jesus. Again, faith of a child. Now, that was a while ago. I don't know if my son would still say that because he's like in the middle of 7th and 8th grade. But I, that was what he said as a third grader. Because I love God and I don't want anyone to hate him. That's it. That's what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. I love Jesus and I don't want anything to hurt him. Ever. And I want to love him better. And that's everything the church gives us, is those two things. How to make it right when we mess it up and how to do it better so we don't mess it up as often. This relationship with Jesus, that's what the church exists for. So what do we do with that? What are the barriers that we have to making that relationship happen? Sin. Sin's one of our barriers. And brokenness. Let's talk about sin first, because why not? Okay. The first barrier is the burden of sin. So I have an archery target up here. My husband is a hunter. He likes to hunt all the things with all the weapons. Um, he, he, does, he just does. One of his favorite things to do is bow hunt for white-tailed deer. Okay, he absolutely loves to bow hunt. When he was learning how to shoot his bow and do archery, I didn't know this. My husband taught me this. He told me that in archery, any of you archers or know arch stuff about archery? Yeah, when you miss, what's it called when you miss the target? It's called a sin. Do you know that? Like in, uh, when the Olympics come, I don't, whenever the Summer Olympics are, watch archery and you'll hear them talk about sin. He sinned. He missed it. Air ball. <laughs> That's a sport I know a little more about anyway. He sinned. That's what a sin really is. A sin is, this is what I was shooting for and I missed it. <laughs> I missed the mark. I didn't hit what I was trying to hit. And because I missed the mark, I hurt my relationship. Again, created for relationship. I hurt my relationship with other people, or I hurt my relationship with God. 
That's what it means to sin. All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God, St. Paul tells us. All have sinned, there's supposed to be an and in there, and are deprived, see that's my grammar Nazi, even on myself. All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. The effect of sin in this world is that we plan with the best intentions. We try really hard to do better. We try really hard to like be nicer and kinder and do the right thing for people in our lives. We try really hard to make it to church. We try really hard to pray every day and our best intentions don't get us there. We miss the mark. We plan to do better and we fail. That's what sin is. That's what happens because of sin. St. Paul also says this, what I do, I do not understand. <laughs> that feels like me a lot of days. What I do, I do not understand. For I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. I called my kids today to talk to them about the eclipse. So here's a really cool thing that I found out today when I was watching the eclipse with some folks here that um, Oshkosh, Wisconsin and Orlando, Florida had the eclipse within 10 minutes of each other. The, t the like fullness of the eclipse was within 10 minutes. Now we're in a different time zone, but it was at within 10 minutes of each other. And we had almost the same exact amount of the sun, of the moon covering the sun. It's just that it was in a different spot. Right? So like if here it was the bottom sliver of the sun, there it was the top sliver of the sun that you could see. So I called my kids today, and I was like, ah, tell me about the eclipse. What did you think of the eclipse? Wasn't it cool? Because I'm trying to get them excited about science and stuff, right? And we didn't watch it. Like, what? <laughs> what is wrong with you? What do you mean you didn't watch it? Here's what happened. Before I left on my trip, I was talking with them about the eclipse and telling them, like, isn't it cool? It's going to line up about the same time. We're going to see very similar things, and it's going to be awesome. And, you know, here's it. We didn't get the glasses because that was a whole thing. But I was like, here's how you can see it, right, with the pinhole projectors and all these different things. And I said to them, but here's the thing, because I'm like, I'm a mom, right, and I'm worried, and I'm not going to be there with them. Don't look at it. They're like, what do you mean, mom? I'm like, well, don't. Like, look through the shadow or something, right? I'm like, but you don't want, I don't want you to actually look at it. Well, why not? I said, because what happens if you look at the sun too long? It hurts your eyes. It hurts your eyes because it's, like, burning your eye. Like that, and that's why when the sun, like, when you stare at the sun during a sunny day, you go, ah, and you look away. Because it hurts, physically hurts your eyes to do that. And I said, but when the eclipse is happening, your eyes don't know to feel hurt. They don't know that that's happening. So you don't get the same like ah, feeling and you want to look away. But you still need to look away. So don't, just don't look at it. I said, you're going to be fine not to worry about it. We have a, a great college girl who's, who watches them when I go on trips. I'm like, Kate's going to be great. She's going to help you. You get to do the shadows. It's going to be, just don't look at it. My seven-year-old was like, well, now I'm going to look at it, Mom. <laughs> I'm like, I just told you it's going to burn your eye. Like, what is wrong with you, child? I called today. We didn't look at the, we didn't, we didn't watch it. Why not? Isaac was too afraid that if he went outside, he wouldn't be able to not look at it. <laughs> My friends, this is sin right there. I have no better explanation or analogy than that. This is sin. What I do, I do not want. <laughs> I want to do the good and yet I do the thing I hate. I have the best intentions, and I know what the right thing to do is, and yet I can't help myself. That was my son's fear today. My son's fear was that he would knew, he knew it's going to burn your eye. What's going to happen if my eye gets burned? I'm like, well, it's not like on fire. Like, he's seven, right? I'm like, <laughs> don't like freak out. I just said, but it might mean that, it might mean that you won't be able to see very well out of that eye. I'm going to go blind. Oh, yeah, I know blind, but you just might not be able to see very well out of that eye anymore, and I don't want that for you. You're already colorblind, child. You've got enough. Like, <laughs> but I thought, I, I literally, he said that to me, and I was thinking about it, and I'm like, that's the perfect definition of sin. We want to do the right thing, and yet we can't help ourselves. Now, so what are we called to do? Well, don't put yourself in the situation 
like my son did, right? He didn't watch the eclipse. He was too afraid he was going to look at the sun. So he just said, I'm not going to watch it. I'm like, did you at least watch it on TV? Because it was cool stuff happening. No, they didn't. It was very disappointing for me because <laughs> I was excited to talk to him about it. But this is it. I do, the good, I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. That's sin. That's us having the best intentions and yet failing every time. Here's the thing about sin. Jesus has already broken the power of sin. He's already conquered it for us. You know how we talked last night, for those of you who are here, about how we do, 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 do. We think we have to do our way into God's love. We also think we have to do our way out of sin. That like, that's fine, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps, I'm going to hang on to my free, or my will, and I'm going to gut my way through it. Jesus has already broken the power of sin. Not he wants to break it, he has already broken the power of sin. He did it. It's done. That's why we can say death is not the final answer. Because he broke the power of sin and he paid the price for our sinfulness. All we have to do is say, I'm so sorry. Lord, I tried to do the right thing. I failed. I had really good intentions and I missed the mark. And I know that hurts you, and I love you. Please forgive me. That's repentance. That's it. It sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? I also know it's the thing I need to do with my husband when I hurt him, but it's really hard to do sometimes. Because we really hold on to a lot of baggage when it comes to our sin. We hold on to sins way longer than the Lord does, especially if it's a sin we've taken to confession. Guess what? He's not holding on to it anymore. If you have taken something to confession and you are still holding on to it, that is all you. That's not him. He has already broken the power of that sin. If you are trapped in a habit of sin or a cycle of sin or an addiction that's leading you to sin, you cannot willpower your way out of it. You can't do it. It's never going to happen. But he has already broken the power of that sin. You just got to take it to him. You just got to let him have it. He will not, he, all he does is give. He will not steal from us. He won't even steal our sin from us. He will not force himself on us. He just gives. And he gives you freedom over that sin. Take it. Lord, I'm so sorry. When we allow Jesus into the junk of our sin, instead of hiding it, when we do what I feel like Adam and Eve should have done, I'm so sorry, Lord, and run and jump into his arms. He gives us that forgiveness every time because he can't withhold it because he is God and God is love and love is gift. Do you see how if you don't see yourself as beloved, you can't ever get to forgiveness? You can't ever know that he wants to forgive you and that he can do nothing but forgive you when you are sorry for your sin. Because he created you for relationship with him. And all he desires is for that relationship to be right and whole and full and what it was created to be. And anytime we hurt that relationship, we have the ability, because he gave us the power, he, he broke the power over sin, we have the ability to simply turn back to him and say, I'm so sorry, Lord, for hurting you. I want this relationship back right again. And he will do it. Not only will he do it, he will give us the strength to walk that sin out of our life forever. It's one of the graces of the sacrament of confession. Not only do we get forgiven for our sins, but we get the strength to not fall into the same temptation again. 
because he has broken the power over sin by his death and resurrection. So that's the first big barrier that we have. The second one is brokenness. We talked about barriers last night. But see, because we were created for relationship, whenever we hurt relationship, it has effects. We carry burdens that are the result of someone else's sin. We carry hurts because someone has sinned against us. And we feel when someone breaks relationship with us, we feel it deeply because we were created for relationship. It hurts when someone harms those relationships, when someone makes decisions or acts out of a way that is damaging to our relationship. It hurts us. But the hurt we feel because of someone else's relationship, I want to make this clear, is not the same as sin. These are two different burdens. One is the way we break our relationship with God and others, and one is the way we hurt because other people have broken their relationship. So I know we have some Spanish speakers in here, and I am very much going to apologize because, here we go, ready? Han pasado muchísimos años hasta que yo he hablado español. Okay. I practiced that lots. Okay. In Spanish, in Spanish, we have a word for what this means. What just happened there? Right? Here I am walking along. In Spanish, the phrase for that, in English we would say I dropped it. In Spanish we would say se me cayó, which means it fell from me. I love Spanish because it's not my fault. <laughs> it fell from me. Same thing for if I forget. We don't say I forget, do we? Se me olvidó, right? Is that right? Like, it left itself from me. <laughs> it's not my fault. It just happened. But that's different than this. Right? That's very different. Because now I threw it down. And it's also different, I don't know the phrase for that in Spanish, that's why I'm not saying it. And it's also different for me to say, no quiero recordar. I don't want to remember. Which is different than, I forgot. Se me olvidó. It left itself from me. That's my favorite. Like, it's not my fault. It left on its own. <laughs> but I love this because I think it shows us the difference between sin and burden. The reality, whether I threw it or I dropped it, is I no longer have it. Right? And one of them is the result of my action, and one of them is the result, in Spanish, of the thing's action on me. It did that to me. Burden are, burdens are things we carry because of something someone else has done. Sins are burdens we carry because of something we have done. Okay, last analogy, and then we're going to pray. I have my backpack. This is my backpack that I travel with because it was my hiking backpack when I did a hiking trip in Colorado. Okay, see my nice backpack here? All right. To be a disciple of Jesus, to give your life to him, to commit to him and say, yes, Lord. He wants to be the Lord over your life. He wants to be the center of your life. Right? If I have my backpack, which I didn't take anything out of except for my computers back there, it's pretty heavy. If I try to walk around the airport on Wednesday when I leave with my backpack like this, how long do you think I'm going to be able to carry it? Not very long. Not very long, right? Because it's not made to be carried this way. It's going to hurt. It's going to cause me issues. I'm going to get like, I don't know, well, muscles for one thing that I don't have, but I might also get like tendonitis, or right? I'm going to have issues if I try to carry it around like this, and I won't be able to carry it very long. What about this? This is when I was in school. This is the cool way to carry your backpack. Right? You don't put bow straps. No way. Right? Now, I can carry it a little bit longer like this than I can the other way, right? But I'm still not going to be able to carry it as long. I'm going to have to switch it back and forth because it's going to get too heavy on this shoulder. I'm going to end up because I'm getting older, and this is a thing that happens after you pass 35. Things start to hurt. It's not okay. I'm not okay with that part of getting older at all. I probably wake up with like a crick in my neck in the morning and my shoulder blades would be all sore. Okay, what if I wear it like this? This is much better. This is how I'm going to carry it through the airport. But I'm going to tell you what, I went hiking with this backpack on a 12,000 foot peak in Colorado. 
this isn't enough for 12,000. I cannot carry it all the way up the mountain like this. I can try, but it's going to hurt, and it's going to cause me back pain, and it's going to cause my legs to hurt, and my shoulders to hurt, and whatever, because this is a hiking backpack. You know what it has? It has a hip, hip belt. Now, my hip belt is broken, and let me tell you, there's, I'm sure, some lesson for me from the Lord in the fact that my hip belt is broken right now, and I'm using this as my analogy, but now I carry most of the weight on my hips for this backpack. It's not even, I mean, like, look. It's not even like sitting on my shoulders right now. I'm carrying on my hips. But even that is not all it has. Well, see, it's broken. <laughs> it has one of these little chest strappy things. Now, if I wear it like this, it has four points of contact on me. My two shoulders right here and my hips. I can carry this backpack with 75 pounds in it, and I am not strong. <laughs> like, you all could kick my butt. <laughs> Right? I'm not strong. But I could carry this backpack up a 12,000 foot peak with, with 75 pounds in it like this. Jesus wants to be the Lord over your entire life. And when we don't give him our yes, when we don't say to him, okay, I trust you, but we still go to church occasionally, or we still like try to play, pray, or we still do these practices, we're like, okay, you can be Lord over this um, hour on Sunday morning. That's what you can be Lord over. Just this hour on Sunday morning, that's what you get. It's going to feel like a really heavy burden every Sunday morning. You're not going to be able to carry it that way for very long. Or we can say to him, all right, you can be Lord over my parenting. Like I really want to raise my kids in the faith. That's important to me. That's a bigger part of my life than Sunday mornings. But it's still not all of it, and it's still going to be a really heavy burden to bear. Or we can say, you know what, you can be my parenting and my marriage. But the rest is mine. My family, though, we've got it down. We've got it down. What about my family, my parenting, my marriage, my job? Lord, you can be Lord of my job. You can be Lord of my finances. You can be Lord of my calendar. He wants to be Lord over our entire lives. And the reason it feels so hard is because we've only given him part of it. And we can't carry that burden with just part of it. What does Jesus say? For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. He tells us, if you make me Lord of your entire life, if you give me all of your sins, if you release all of your burdens, if you give me everything in your life, even if you don't know what that means, his promise is, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you trust him? Do you trust him enough to give him your sins and your burdens? Do you trust him enough to say, yes, Lord, even if I don't really know what that means, I want relationship with you. I want you to be the center of my life. That's what I want, Lord. We're going to pray now. Here's the thing. He's inviting you. Oh, I can't forget this. Okay. Commercial time. This book, this book is like the last night's talk and tonight's talk for elementary school kids. <laughs> this is a phenomenal book. I have this one I have on the back table back there. I highly recommend it. It's God's love, Jesus' death and resurrection, invitation into relationship with him in beautiful color and like if you're a parent and you've ever had to read a Catholic storybook to a kid that has like six paragraphs on one page. This isn't that. It's got like two sentences on a page. Okay, highly recommend that. All right, now let's pray. I just don't want to forget that one because I know some of you, that's a big thing. Here's what I want to do for our prayer tonight. I'm going to have you close your eyes again. I want you to take some time to think about the burdens that you carry. They may be burdens of sin, or they may be burdens of brokenness. 
what's weighing you down? Some of them might be all the way back from your childhood. Start to reflect on times when you have hurt your relationship with God and others. I want you to imagine the place in your heart where you have tried to hide your sin, where you've tried to hide your brokenness from the Lord. Lord, I want you everywhere but not there. I want you to imagine that place. And when and if you are ready to give those things to him, I want you to take one hand and rest it palm up on your leg in front of you. I want you to take your other hand and place it over your heart. With your eyes closed, I want you to think of each of those burdens, and I want you to physically pull that burden out of your heart and put it in your hand. Pull out the brokenness that you've never named to anyone. Pull out the relationship that hurts so much to even think about. Pull out the physical pain that means you sometimes can't get through the day or aren't sure how you're going to do it. Pull out the anxiety and the worry that feel like they're just weighing you down. Pull out the mental illness that makes it harder for you than it is for others. Pull out the memory from your childhood that hurts you the most. Whatever your burdens are of brokenness, pull them out and put them in your hand. And think about your sins the burden of sin that you've been carrying, the secret that you would never want anyone to ever know you have done, pull it out and put it in your hand. The sin that you've confessed over and over and over again and you just can't seem to be rid of, or the sin you confessed that one time but you still feel so horrible about it. The ways that you've hurt God in the ways that you've hurt others. Pull them out and put them in your hand. Keep going into the deepest places of your heart, the most hidden places that you wouldn't want anyone to ever know about. The thing that you've always said, well, I could never even confess that because I would have to say it out loud. Keep pulling until you have nothing left to pull out. Every burden, every brokenness, every sorrow over your sin. If while we're doing this, you hear a voice that's accusing you, just say, not now, and continue pulling those things out. When you're done, I want you to take the hand that was over your heart and did the pulling underneath the hand that is holding all of your burdens. If you still have more burdens to pull, go ahead and keep pulling them. If you have more brokenness, if you can't even name it, that's okay. Pull it out. He knows what it is. With your eyes still closed, if you are ready to give these things over to Jesus, I invite you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for creating me in your image and likeness. 
I thank you for making me your beloved son or daughter. You know my heart. You know that I can't always accept the love you have for me. Today, I ask for the grace to give you my burdens. To give you sorrow for my sin. And to never take them up again. In the name of Jesus Christ. And by the power of his cross. I break now. All power and all authority that these burdens have over my life. I declare myself free in the love and power of Jesus Christ. I choose to stand in the freedom of the kingdom of God. I know my identity depends only on your love for me. I declare that love over my life and receive it with an open heart. And so I ask that you take these and lift your hands up if you're ready to give them to him and unite them to your wounds on the cross and pour forth new life in me. Thank you for the freedom and healing you are bringing me now. I love you, Lord. I desire to give you my whole heart, even if I have no idea what that means. I come back to the Father, and I declare you, Jesus, the Lord of my life. Teach me to love and to become even more fully what you have created me to be. I ask this in your most precious and glorious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. To close, we are going to pray a, uh, a discipleship prayer. So all of you received a card, yes? Do you have your card? So on the front, it says, come follow me, which is Jesus' call to each one of us to follow him as his disciples. On the back side is the prayer, and it's, it's formulated as a call and response. So the first part Lord, starts out, Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the bold is when we'll respond. What I'll invite you to do is anytime you leave campus here, anytime you leave campus, I would like you invite you to pray this prayer. Whenever we leave our church, we're going out into the mission fields. We're called to, to bring God's love that he has for each and every one of us to wherever we are, whether it's the doctor's office, whether it's, you know, Publix down the street, whether it's our own home, to share that. We're going out into the mission fields. So I invite you to take this card, put it somewhere in your car that you'll see it, and before you leave campus, pray this prayer with whoever's in your car, this discipleship prayer, as a reminder that we are all called to follow Jesus Christ and to share that love that God the Father has for each and every one of us with others. So to leave us in this prayer, I've asked Father David to lead us. Thank you, John. Lord Jesus Christ, you call me to follow you as your disciple. Lord Jesus Christ, you give me everything I need to carry out your will. Lord Jesus Christ, you send me to proclaim the good news. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace.